Welcome to Unforbidden Truth. I'm Andrew. On this week's episode, I'll be speaking with Washington double murderer Cecil Davis. Cecil Davis is convicted of the rape, robbery, and murder of 65-year-old Yoshiko Couch in Pierce County, Washington. Yoshiko was robbed, raped, and smothered to death with a towel containing a poisonous substance that is found in household cleaners. Her body was found in a bathtub. Cecil is also convicted of murdering another woman, Jane Hungerford Trapp, who was killed in Tacoma, Washington in 1996. She was stomped to death at the hands of Cecil Davis. Cecil received a life sentence for the murder of Trapp. Cecil received the death penalty in 1998 for the murder of Yoshiko Couch. The death penalty was abolished in Washington in 2018, which in turn leaves Cecil Davis serving two life sentences for the two murders he's convicted of. I talked to Cecil about his life growing up, and the two cases that landed him in prison. Here's my interview with convicted double murderer Cecil Davis. Uh -huh. Global tail link prepaid call from Cecil. An inmate at Washington State Penitentiary. Cecil, what was your childhood like growing up? Uh, playful. I like to play a lot of games. Like, uh, kickball when I go to school, grade school, and, uh, Football, but I got old enough to play football. Right. What was it? What was it like? What was it like as a child? Did you, you know, did you have a good childhood? Do you have, did you have a bad childhood? Is there anything that stood out to you, whether it be positive or bad. negative? I had a bad uh, uh, childhood. My stepdad, uh, uh, he used to beat me every day for nothing. Um, he uh, he passed away. When he was uh, 37, but before he passed away, for five years, he beat me. And how'd that make you feel? Well, uh, I planned to kill him. You know, that's what my plan was, but he died before I could get old enough to get a gun, but he died before then. Uh, cancer. Was there any other type of abuse that had occurred, whether sexual, physical, emotional? Well, just emotional, you know, I, uh, I tried to, uh, uh, my, my sister, she used to tell lies on me, so my uh, stepdad, he beat me for the lies she told. And, um, uh, uh, none of the other kids, my mom had seven kids, and I was number four, and none of the other kids got any beat with nothing about it. When he came to me, you know, he beat me. Right. Was there any other type of abuse or any type of trauma you can think of that may have made an impact on you as a child? Well, yeah, okay. I, uh, I, uh, when I was, when I was, when I was a kid, I, uh, I had, I went to a special aid class. And during that time, uh, you know, they were saying, well, everybody who goes to special aid is retarded, but that's not true. Uh, I, had, uh, I had I had a difficult time learning. I can, I, it's like I can learn, but I can't, uh, I can't remember what I learned. That was my, that was, that was my biggest uh, setback. That, again, I was scared when I got home in school that my dad, the dad was going to beat me. That was just, you know, Really, really glad he, uh, you know, passed away when he did. Right. So, so you were more motivated to do good in school, so you wouldn't get beat. Well, I, actually, I did worse because uh, I, I got nervous when I, uh, when I took a test or something. I got nervous and I knew I was going to get beat regardless. And he did. He beat me regardless. What kind of hell for him? He beat me regardless. Right. Again, it, at the end, at the last end, of it, he, uh, I was getting ready to run away. He said, well, come on, let me whip your ass one more time, man. And I'm like, okay. So he got to beat no man stuff. And my mom had to come and catch me, come in. That was because I couldn't breathe. Every time he beat me, I could, I could not breathe or anything. I was like, you know, just a like 11, 12 year old kid. Right. Wait. But he's gone now. I had I had made plans to kill him with his own gun. So he he keeps his gun on on the chest drawer where uh, uh, he 
put his car key in, you know, cash it. But I had, I had plenty of killer. Well, well, it was not really, uh, like I said, I had, uh, he had a 38 and 22 uh, pistol. And, uh, he kept that on the trash store as he tore through the bedroom. I could kill him with his own gun. That's the part of the bed. That's it. Just couldn't take t- couldn't take it anymore, and you know, no. what were your years like? You know, in school, elementary, middle school, high school. What was your behavior like? You know, what? How did you? You know, essentially act in school. Well, I was uh, in, in grade school. I was I was a, a shy kid. Uh, I did. Uh, I I enjoyed boarding school because we got a chance to play. You know. Grade school football, not football, but um, kickball. And, uh, you know, uh, they have, you know, again, they have provided us with free lunches and stuff. And I'm looking forward to that because they would they would provide stuff like a lot of these type of and a orange and a couple of cookies. So, uh, I was happy with being, being a special agent, just made me happy, uh, you know, to be there. It wasn't, it wasn't like, you know, if I was told for something, because the special agent in class, did nobody teach. But as soon as I got home, I got teased a lot. Did you ever get in any physical altercations at work? Did you ever get suspended or expelled or anything like that? Well, you would think I would, because as I, as I moved forward, uh, I, uh, me and a friend of mine, my buddy, we, we were stopped by the, uh, the candy store. He sold, he sold MD, 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 uh, uh, wine. And we would, we would buy a, a trip for MD wine, Mad Dog, and we would drink that before we go to class. So you weren't really much of a troublemaker or anything like that in school, or? No, I was, I was more like, uh, I was a cool dude, you know, that, that kind of, uh, uh, teacher, she they they all you know, work with you, and I was a cool dude. I I I didn't get in no trouble or anything. My only theory was that me and my me and my uh, friends and stuff, we would sit outside the school and drink mad dogs and then go and class drugs. <laughs> as far as you know, do you know if there's any history of mental illness in your family that you can recall? Um, I, I can't recall what it is with my dad's side. My, uh, uh, okay, my dad, he was, uh, uh, I think he was a physical, uh, A2, and, uh, uh, his brother was my uncle. They all, you know, died of, uh, you know, their, their illness. Right. Have you yourself been diagnosed with any mental illnesses? Well, yeah, but I was in the army. They died of, we would have, with a multiple Post traumatic stress disorder? Yes. PTSD, yes. okay. Yes. Do you take any type of medication or any do any type of treatment or anything like that in prison? I, I, yeah, in prison, yeah. In prison, uh, it, it was like I had multiple, uh, I don't know why I can't remember this word. Multiple personality disorder? That's it, right there. That's what, yeah. that's what you're diagnosed with? Yeah. Do you have any other diagnoses or diagnoses? No, uh, that would be all, you know, except for, you know, that I was slow and I could, you know, pick up on things fast. I didn't have to take my time and I could get to the job done. I get to the job done. Cecil, up until the crimes that you're in prison for now, did you have any type of history or were you on the radar of law enforcement at the time? Yes, I was. What kinds of things were you doing to get their attention? Well, I was, I uh, specialized in burglary. I was ready to go home during, during school time and uh, cook, cook me something to eat. Uh, 
I would, uh, when I'm checked and healthy, you know, I would, I would do, you know, I would look for coins and stuff that I could put in my pocket and walk away. That's what it did. How many times would you guesstimate that you burglarized people that you have not been prosecuted for? Oh, man, I, I have never been prosecuted before. I mean, I got caught, I got caught one time, and uh, I went to McKeown School for Boys. That was, that was uh, uh, my playing spell. But besides that, how many other times would you say that you did burglarize what you were not arrested, prosecuted um, for, or anything like that? We're, we're talking about 10, 9 times a week. Oh, wow. Okay, okay. Um, did you ever harm anybody in the process? No, no. Everybody I made sure nobody was home before I got into it. Did you look at certain houses to see who wasn't home, who was home? Yes. What I would do uh, before I put in, I would uh, knock on the door with nobody answered. The next day I come and I, and I have my tools with me. And I would break into the house and uh, you know, give what I can. Only things that only things that I can carry, like money and diamond rings, is uh, bracelets and uh, you know, just things that you know that I I got. I once got a pearl, black pearl uh, 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 ring. I mean, finger, bigger ring, and uh, I, I got a wash matching it. And, it, it was it was about like twenty thirty thousand dollars a piece. So you were after the the big scores, the get something, get some cash quick, and were you yeah. were you doing this to support a drug habit or anything of the sorts, or were you just you know? Uh, well, I was doing it because I was hungry. We never had breakfast at home. Yeah, I was ready all the food. That, that, that food. So you know, I uh, that's why I told you the first one. Yeah. Uh, I would go to the house and get good food for me. And that, you know, the key is, you know, that's the only thing I understood. So let's talk about the cases in which you're in prison for. You are convicted of the rape and murder of 65-year-old Yoshiko Couch and the stomping death of 45-year-old Jang Hungerford Trap. And that was two separate incidents. Can you walk us through the confluence of events regarding the murder of Yoshiko Couch and how that came about? Well, uh, I, had, I had two co-conspirators with me. And uh, uh, what it was, the uh, younger guys, the young gang members, stuff like that, they was hungry and uh, they didn't have no money. So uh, um, we planned to uh, break into this couch at the house and steal the food and what money she had on hand. And what happened is that uh, uh, the three of us read bath water. And after running the bath water, she got inside the bath water and we held her head down until she passed out. At the time of the murder of Yoshiko Couch, you lived a few doors down from Yoshiko at the time of the murder, and witnesses report that the night before the murder and in the morning around 2.30 a.m., you and your friends were outside. Uh, George Wilson and Keith Burns were outside smoking a cigarette, hanging out, and you had commented, I need to kill me a motherfucker, hours prior to the murder of Yoshiko Couch. That's, that's completely wrong. I, I never said that. You never said I that? I don't appetize, no, I don't appetize my, my skills, you know what I'm saying? And I, got, I had a rule. I would not, I would not, I believe all burglaries in the area where my mom lived in, I wouldn't do anything in that area. I would go outside the area and do my uh, burglaries and, uh, uh, do burglaries and, have, and uh, just, you know, by myself. And I never, I never, this was the first time that I had involved myself with two kids. But they was, they was young and they was dumb and, they were hungry and they were hoarding because they couldn't sleep my nieces uh, while they were here. Your co-defendant, George Wilson, was quoted as saying, Cecil and I went into the to rip the lady off, but Cecil kicked in the door and started beating on her and rubbing all over her. 
negative. That didn't happen? Yeah, that didn't happen. That's, uh, I don't know where he got that from because uh, when, I, when I left there, they stayed there. And uh, I don't, it's hard to believe these kids would, would do what they said that yeah, I did. Well, I didn't do nothing. Are, are you saying you're innocent of that murder or you had nothing to do with it or were you just there and it happened in I, front of you? I was innocent up to a point where I would uh, uh, let Jim do it. I didn't think they would do it. Well, I, I simply didn't do it. And, uh, you know, the, the coroner's report said that uh, she was strangled. And she wasn't strangled. She was uh, drowned. The actual cause of death was she was smothered with a towel soaked in xylene, which is a toxin found in cleaning agents and other solutions. After she was brutally raped before that as well. I believe she was uh, raped with an object, I want to say. No, that never that, that happened, man. So this is what's known. Her husband, who was disabled on the left side of his body due to uh, being paralyzed due to a stroke, he witnessed you raping his wife and then murdering her no no that's negative that 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 would happen did she have a husband that was partially paralyzed he was he was he was paralyzed and she was the caregiver and stuff but uh he could get out the bed and if on uh, if i was to do or if i was to do something to his wife and i wouldn't i wouldn't do that shit to him why wouldn't you if you went in there to rob them and uh you know she was already dead or or she was being murdered why why leave the witness behind no uh i wouldn't have left a witness behind in the first place and, I, and in the second place i would have never did it that close to home if you weren't involved in the murder you had the capability to stop it why didn't you stop it if you were able See, I, was, I was i was a victim and uh, i was i was there when it happened she didn't, she didn't, she died, when she died, she got out of drowning. She, she didn't die of uh, anything else. She was smothered to death, yeah, and then she was, she was found in the bathtub, but she was smothered to death um, with a towel psych, soaked in xylene. So she, the cause of death was not drowning, but it was, you know, she was smothered to death with a towel soaked in xylene. But that's, that's negative because uh, she was never smothered. She was drowned. I'm telling you, I was, you know, I was a witness to that. She was drowned. And as far as having something on her head, there was nothing on her head. I don't know, I don't know where they get that shit from. But, uh, there was actual DNA testing. So, so you were present while she was killed, though you're innocent? I was innocent. I wasn't, I wasn't in any way or form or shape responsible for that. I'm just the major scapegoat because I was the oldest, and then it wasn't, you know, why I, I did it. I, I would be like to, of course, then um, they keep speaking. And, and so you can walk the walk and talk the talk. No, you can't just take it for granted what people tell you to do. Because that's why I'm on the phone right now talking to you. I, it's, it's no way well I was able to ever. The police recovered quite a bit of evidence that was frankly overwhelming in your possession, which belonged to Yoshiko, and this all included a pack of cigarettes with one of Yoshiko's fingerprints on it, meat from the Fort Lewis commissary, which you didn't have access to when Yoshiko did, beer cans, soda cans, Yoshiko's wedding ring, and cash from her purse that was missing all found in uh, your possession uh, just three doors down from where Yoshiko lived, where the murder happened. Well, well my only thought would say is that I was, uh, 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 oh, well, wait a minute, okay. Okay, what happened? He is six years ago. What they did, they, uh, uh, I guess they had some money to cash on and stuff. But they came and woke me up across this my mom's house. They came and woke me up, and I, I told her they couldn't spend a night there. They said, well, other people, can we, uh, can we, 
can we have you to cook this for us and you get you some, some money? You know, I was broke and didn't have no money. So I said, yeah, I'll do that. And uh, the next day, uh, uh, the police was at her house. And I, I noticed, I didn't, I didn't know she was there. But they told me that they didn't kill her. So I said, yeah, I'll bring her back to me and the pipe me out. But, uh, you know, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm paying an but I should have stopped. I understand that. But um, so how did all the evidence end up in your um, apartment? You know, the soda cans, wedding ring, cash missing from her purse, the cigarette pack. Were, were those planted or did you take those? How did they how did they end up in your apartment? The kids took it and they brought it to me and they asked me to watch it. And they were paying me about watching for. So uh, I was I would say I was guilty of it for being uh, uh, uh and, and and it had been having having uh, uh stole the stole the property is for oh I was looking at it. You're saying that you paid the kids to uh watch a pack of cigarettes, meat from the commissary, uh <laughs> They was hungry. I told like I told you before, they was hungry. And they couldn't have nothing. They could my mom my mom wasn't no big deal. Nothing to eat. But they was hungry. And they came back and said, Oh see so we cook here for us and, and eat just for us. And if you do all this, we give you uh we gave you fifty bucks a day and uh I could eat I could eat and drink without out out just holy shit. They fell in my possession, and I'm in the police. You know, that's what I told them. I'm told, I'm, I told them the same thing that I'm telling you. Is that but they going the police going in, and you know we ever had some rain together, so uh, uh, two teenagers. You know, they, especially Anthony Ruffin, he was, uh, you know, guilty of all that stuff. But they get that's, that's why the police. I mean, they found out stuff. In my mom's home under my bed. After this murder happens, subsequently you're charged and convicted of murder, and then you are sentenced to death in 1998. And you were also convicted for a second murder, which also was in 1996. 45-year-old Jang Hungerford Trap, in which you received a life without parole sentence on top of the death sentence, which was eventually commuted to life after the abolishing of the death penalty here in Washington State. Can you tell us about the second murder about Jane Hungerford Trap? Well, okay. You know, I, I'm, I'm not going to get you to answer all this. So, it was about to say it's the whole truth and nothing but the truth. Okay? Okay, what happened was that uh, me and uh, Hungerford Trap we were smoking crack cocaine, and uh, I not smoking. I had to have sex. So what? Uh, so I asked her if she would give me a blowjob, and she said no. I said, "Well, you just smoked my, you just smoked my crack, and I want, I want a blowjob." So uh, I made it. I said she would do it, so I killed her. So because she wouldn't perform oral sex on you, it upset you to the point where you wanted to kill her. Or you had to kill her? Yes. Yes. The only reason why she did right now to the thing is she didn't give me a blow job that she was supposed to give me for smoking my crack. Do you think that was the right thing to do at the moment, or do you think you could have done something different? Well, uh, that was the right thing to do at the moment. See, there's a, there's a role in the street. For females, if they if you get them high, oh crap, they're supposed to be going crazy. And she and they call for trap do that. When she goes smoke my crack and try to get out of it, she'll give me a phone job. So I went ahead and killed her. Was this just some woman that you randomly met or did you have a prior relationship with her? Were you dating her or was this just some woman that you picked up on the street? What was your relationship to her? Out, uh, looking for somebody to uh, get a high. 
And I met her around about two, three o'clock this morning. I told her in the morning. She said, okay, she agreed with it, but um, she, she didn't, she didn't, she didn't, did not uh, do what she's supposed to do. Because if she had, she'd be still alive. You're convicted of murder with Yoshiko Couch, which you claim you're innocent for. You're convicted of the murder of Jane Hungerford Trap, which you receive life without the possibility of parole, which you are guilty for, which you admit guilt on. Are you suspected of any other homicides? I'm suspected of, uh, uh, I'm suspect of, uh, uh, this 85 year old woman, her name is Miss Georgia. And she stayed right next door to my sister. And, uh, you know, she, whoever, whoever killed her, they, uh, they left the door open of her, of her house and, uh, took out her, 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 uh, the police and the, uh, detective told us that her, uh, wedding ring was gone. So what happened with that part, uh, I don't know. But the second day that she had, uh, the second day that she had, uh, they were to appeal, two white guys, they said they came into a pawn shop and they tried to sell uh, the pawn for waiter rent. They, they seen the, the uh, owner of the pawn shop on the phone talk to the police because it was, they had pictures of her ring at the time. So what happened is that uh, they took off. So it's probably um, two white guys that were was responsible for the third one you're suspected of. Yes. So you're suspected of a third murder. How many people in total have you murdered yourself? Six. So you've killed six people. I killed six people. Where did the other five come into play since you're innocent of the first one and the third one? Well, uh, it was, it was good, uh, I'm trying to think of the name on the, uh, the company. I can't think of the name real quick, but I would go and, uh, get, try to get ready to, uh, see what crack happened. Do you happen to remember the name of these victims or what color they were? No. You don't remember any of the facial features, the location, how old they might have been, what the what color hair they would have had, you know, how their body was built, how tall, short they were. No, I uh, I, I I can't remember that. That's you know, only thing I only thing I did was uh, I went over there and uh, to to uh, my habit to take care of my habit. I did that. And I would take you to where they were. This is the only thing I could carry out. But, uh, uh, I can't tell you. They was, I was a victim of the white boy. And it was at, uh, 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 old folks, uh, home, old folks, nursing home. But, but see, I'm telling you that, uh, I'm, I'm, and if the police come and talk to me, I'm just going to play like I don't know what you're talking about because uh, they they are looking to pin me on uh, just just Miss George's murder, but if they got any other murder, who uh, of course I ain't seen it, but they don't they know do it. At this point in time, if they were to, it's not like you can. Uh... You can get any worse sentences. You're essentially doing two life without the possibility of parole. So at this point in time, you know, I, I guess it's, you know, fair game to the state, but it'd be, uh, that'd be interesting. But, uh, you know, they would obviously have to have the full details and they would have to, you know, make sure it's legit. And without you having the, the names or any details of, of them, I think that'd be pretty hard to um, corroborate the stories. Person I told her, and uh, you know, I uh, I'm not I'm not in the business of telling you myself to nobody. You are the first man as far as as far as the ages. It was a risky home. You can expect anybody over seven years old was was uh, uh freak a freak ticket to uh you know supplying my junk. I don't, I don't, I don't want to 
going to tell you everything that happens, but you asked me a question, I told you that I answered it that way I can. We can save that conversation for when they actually slap charges on you, um, because I don't want to. I don't want you to give up your your secrecy and your your secrets. Yeah, that's that's exactly what would happen. Before we conclude this, Cecil, is there anything you would like to say or get out? You know, now's your time to, you know, use this platform to speak to the public or say what you want to say. Thank she she would never let me in her home in the first place. She she was just a uh, type of woman she she didn't know me. At least I don't think she knew me, but I would tell her I and pick up a paper in the yard and you know, I I I, I didn't know her but I I um uh, she would never let me in the house in the first place. As far as home group travel is concerned. That was to supply my height, my crack habit. That was, and I'd like to take that back because I can't take, I, I can't only take your life one time. And I, I regret that. I regret taking her life because she wouldn't, you know, that was, I was just a strung out, you know, crack at it. And most of the time, that's what happened. That was my interview with double murderer Cecil Davis. Thank you for listening. I'm <laughs>